Hi, I am Mrs. Sloan, and this video is intended for my honors biology students, and this is photosynthesis part two. All right, I'm gonna make myself a little bit smaller, and I'm gonna put this in presentation mode. And I wanna remind you, okay, is, oh, hi. Okay, I'm not gonna move, there we go. I wanna remind you that if you're new to my videos, that down at the bottom in the descriptor, I have notes that my students use. Column one are the outlines, kind of the scaffolding of the notes, and I'll help you fill those in. And column two is where you want to throw in pictures that are helpful for you. All right, so this is photosynthesis part two. What we have already discussed using our notes is we have talked about the structure of a chloroplast and wavelengths of light and the light reaction. That has already been discussed, the light dependent reactions, both non-cyclic and cyclic photophosphorylation. So now this is the part about we bring it home and we make some sugars. But the first thing I want to remind you of is the structure of the chloroplast. So remember, you have this outer membrane here, double membrane, makes you think of endosymbiotic hypothesis. You've got all of these folded membranes here. These are these stacks of pancakes, looks like, are, are called grana. And if you look at just one, that's called a grana. And you can see all these folds. And what are all these folds going to do, it's going to increase what? Surface area, right? And on these folded thylakoid membranes um, is where you did your light reaction. Remember, you concentrated hydrogen ions to the interior. So when they went through ATP synthase complex, you made ATP due to photosystem two, and then you excited those electrons a second time from water and you reduced some NADP. So those things are now available for you out here in the stroma where we're going to do the Calvin cycle or the light independent reaction or old school name is the dark reaction. So if we look here, we can look at the products of the light reaction, right? You, you know where you're, you're at. Here's water, splitting water. The electrons are used to make both ATP and to reduce NADP. And from that splitting of water, you have oxygen gas that is released and not used in the Calvin cycle, right? And to get those electrons excited so you can reduce the NADP and make ATP, you're using light from the sun. Now here in the Calvin cycle, you're gonna have a preloaded molecule called RUBP, who is already preloaded in here, just like we did when we did the Krebs cycle in cellular respiration. And so what we wanna do is hook that CO2 to up with that RUBP and rearrange the molecules using ATP, provide some energy there and also some reduced NADP. And what we hope to kind of skim out is sugar. So the same amount of carbon that we add into the Calvin cycle, we take out as sugar and then just kind of keep this party going over here. The, we return the oxidized NADP and ADP to the light reaction so it can be reused again. So the overview of it in your notes, I am at 8.3 in the notes, the Calvin cycle reactions where it says fixing CO2 into glucose. We're, I'll explain this in a little bit, but we're gonna do two turns with three CO2 per turn, and it is a series of reactions producing carbohydrates, a series of reactions producing carbohydrates. And you can see what it requires. It requires CO2, you got that right here, and that's gonna to bind to a five carbon molecule called RUBP, forming a six carbon molecule. And it's using an enzyme, probably the most prolific enzyme on the on the planet. It's one name is Rubisco, um, another name is RUBP carboxylase. And I put that in your notes, but if you wanna add in Rubisco, you can do that as well. And then I gave you uh, the names of the reactions. All right, so let's get started on that. So I know this isn't a great picture. This is a picture from your book. Um, I'll give you a better one here in a minute, but get your bearings right here. Here's your solar energy. Things here in gray are the light dependent reactions. And then you can see here the Calvin cycle out here in the stroma. What I want you to pay attention to right now on this picture is there's basically three segments of the Calvin cycle. There's the carbon fixation. And just like nitrogen fixation in the nitrogen cycle, it's where you take um, a gas and make it into a solid. So here we're fixing the gas CO2 and we're hooking it up with RUBP. And it's very unstable when we do that, but anyway, that part of going from a gas to a solid, that is carbon fixation. Then the next part you see here is CO2 reduction. Remember, when we reduce something, we give it energy. We're giving it energy. Where are we giving it from? If something's getting reduced, something else must be oxidized, right? Here you can see the um, NADPH. We're going to oxidize that and give those electrons to CO2. This is all going to require a little energy and some rearrangement 
arrangement of bonds. So we'll use ATP to do that. So that's the CO2 um, reduction stage. Now at that point, you will basically have um, enough um, high energy molecules called G3P or old school name is PJL. G3Ps or PJL, same thing, those are halves of glucose. So if you notice what you have right here, you have six G3Ps, six halves of glucose. So if we hook them all together, we would have three glucose molecules, right? But if we did that, we'd be done. We couldn't continue on. This is a cycle that keeps going, going, and going. So what we're going to do is look to see what you brought in. Do you see how you brought in three CO2s here at the top? If you put three CO2s in, you're putting three, C, three carbons into the system. That means you could take three carbons out to keep your party going. So you're going to remove just one of those because one of those, a half of a glucose, will have three carbons in it, right? So you remove one, you're left over with five of these halves of glucose. we got to keep going on our party here. So we're going to invest a little bit of ATP in order to regenerate. And that gives us part three, the regeneration of our UVP so we can bring in three more CO2, pump them up with some ATP and some reduced NADP and pull out three more. Now, if we do three CO2s in, three carbons in, three CO2, I'm sorry, three CO2s in, three carbons out. So now we have, in the process of doing two turns at three, three CO2s a turn, we would have one glucose, right? Okay, and then we would have a net balanced um, reactions. Now, it can do it however it wants. I'm just showing you how to do a, a net balanced reaction. So that's why you can see step one, step two, step three in your notes. The fixation of CO2 is going from a gas to a solid. That's what you want to put in your notes, gas to a solid. And then step two is the reduction of carbon dioxide, and this is an energy upgrade. Okay. And then step three is the regeneration of RUBP to keep the cycle turning. And you've got some more notes in there I'm going to help you with right here. All right. So here, if you look at these red balls right here, those represent the carbons. There's hydrogens, there's oxygens, there's phosphate groups. We're not going to be worried about that. Let's just follow the carbons. All right. So RUBP is a five carbon molecule and we've got three of them. So five, five, five. That's 15 carbons, right? Because we've got three of these five carbon molecules. Each of these five carbon molecules, we're going to hook up with a CO2 and five plus one, right, is six. So when we do this, we're just doing it three, three times, right? So five plus one, five plus one, five plus one. We will then have, right, we will have six, or sorry, I don't know why I said that. We will then have three C6s, which we will then break because it's very unstable. We'll break them all in half. So instead of having three C6s, and this isn't a C6, it's a glucose, it's just a different C6 molecule, you'll break each of those in half. So you will have six C3s. It's just that they're very, very low energy. Okay. So this step right here, okay, this step right here is your first one on your notes. Step one fixation of carbon dioxide gas to a solid, and you can see it says, I wanna make sure you understand the notes, each CO2 molecule binds to a five carbon molecule called RUBP, it's right here, forming a six carbon molecule that is not shown in this particular diagram, okay, using the enzyme RUBP carboxylase, and I would even highlight that in your notes right now, okay? Each newly formed six carbon molecule breaks in half, and that's what you're seeing right here. So now you have three of these six carbons, each one breaks in half, you have six C3s. So now we're ready for step two, the energy upgrade. So each, each of these is given a phosphate from ATP. So all six of them are given a phosphate from ATP. Then each is reduced, and we're gonna use this right here, right? Then each is reduced by NADPH forming then six of these high these high energy molecules that are half of a glucose old school name is pjl new school name is g3p okay and then what we're going to do you can see at this point siphon off one of those so you're going to take one away take one g3p away and you're going to be left with five right and then those are going to get returned so your next step, step three, regeneration of RUBP to keep the cycle turning, you're gonna use these three ATP right here, okay, to rearrange the remaining five G3P into three more RUBP. 
Now, we've brought in three CO2s, but you know the balanced equation for photosynthesis is, right? It's six CO2. We only use three so far. So let's do the whole thing again. And when you do the whole thing again and you pull off another G3P, now we pulled off two, and that would be equal to one glucose. That would be the equivalent. So when the cycle has occurred two times, each starting with three CO2, you will have invested a total of six carbon atoms to form one glucose. All right, perfect. I hope you understood that chemistry. Um, I have a song that I do with this. There's a song for the light reaction and there's also a song for the Calvin cycle. And so I'm just gonna sing it to you so it'll be a little familiar when we do it in class. We're gonna start right here. And it goes three C five plus three C one makes, and you can see I'm right here, three C six, break down to six, C3. Okay, so we had three C6s. We're breaking them in all in half. Break down to six C3. Then you're going to use some ATP, use some reduced NADP. So you can see that right here. Use some ATP, use some reduced NADP on your six C3. Take one away. PGAL, G3P. I give both names just in case, okay? Take one away, PGAL, G3P. And then you go jazz hands to get your hands in the right spot. And you're left with 5C3. Use some ATP to build 3C5 plus 3C1 makes 3C6. Break down to 6C3. Use some ATP, use some reduced NADP on your 6C3. Take one away, but now we've really taken two away, so now we get to go glucose, jazz hands. And you're left with 5C3, use some ATP, two build, 3C5, stop. And then you're done, okay? Then you're done. So let's talk about this G3P and the importance of G3P. That's the next thing in our notes. G3P, this half of glucose, can be used to build everything you need to build in the cell. You can use it to build glucose. You can hook it up with fructose. You can make sucrose. You can make fatty acids, amino acids. You can make starch. You can build cell walls with it, with cellulose. So that's the importance of G3P. So what you want to have on your notes for the importance of photosynthesis, G3P slash PGAL is the first reactant of several different plant products, glucose and other sugars, starch, cellulose, fatty acids, and amino acids. And oh yeah, by the way, you get to be alive because you get oxygen and you get food from that. And then I want to show you one other thing. Do you remember when we did the cellular respiration? Remember the first step is glycolysis. Who does it all cells? What do you start out with? Glucose, how many carbon? Six. What are you going to do? Break it in half. Ten steps, ten different enzymes, right? What are these called? Two pyruvic acids and you reduce some NAD and make some ATP. Two. So that was glycolysis. Who does it? All cells. Do you remember? We really had to spin two ATP first to get the party started, and then we got four back so we would net out two ATP. Let me show you how this ties in, the G3P, okay? Remember how we had to spin two ATP to end glycolysis to get our party started? As soon as you took that glucose and you broke it in half, one of the early compounds before you got to the pyruvic acid, 10 steps, 10 different enzymes, look right here, G3P. That's right before you reduce some NAD and make some ATP. So plants oftentimes won't even build the glucose from it. If they need to do cellular respiration in their mighty mitochondria, they'll leave it as G3P. Why would that be strategic for them to leave it as G3P? Do you know why? I hope you said, because then you don't have to spend the two ATP to get the party started. Your party's already started. And then you could just jump right into the energy harvesting stages. All right. So where can this go wrong? Um, the issues is with RUBP carboxylase, okay? Sometimes, see, he's in the corner, RUBP. Sometimes he gets in trouble, and the reason is when CO2 levels get low and oxygen levels get high, 
Our UBP is tempted by the fruit of another. It starts hooking up with oxygen instead of hooking up with CO2. That is really, really bad. It's called photorespiration, and you can see its name right here. So when CO2 hooks up with our UBP, that's good, carbon fixation. But when O2 hooks up with RUBP, that is bad. Now let me remind you where the RUBP is, okay? Let me go back a little bit. That's right where we started. This is RUBP. Remember 3C5 plus 3C1, the C1s are CO2. If instead of hooking up with this carbon, it hooks up with oxygen, that's called um, photorespiration. You're not gonna get any glucose out of it. You're not gonna get any ATP out of it, like cellular respiration. So it's just bad all around for a plant. So here, okay, this would be a normal plant. There are what, what is called, you, you can see your Calvin cycle, right? And right here, RUBP is supposed to hook up with CO2, and this would be your standard mesophyll cell, which would be in the middle of a leaf, okay? And it's supposed to hook up with CO2, but if our, uh, O2 comes in there, that's bad. Now, why would it do that? because the CO2 levels are low. Maybe the stomata are closed on the leaves. And so as a result of that, it's doing a bunch of photosynthesis, releasing all this oxygen gas, which ends up competing okay, with the process of photosynthesis because it's consuming all the CO2 and generating a lot of oxygen. So let's look at some different strategies. Your standard plant is called a C3 plant, okay? Here's a cross section of its leaf. You can see the mesophyll are right here in the middle, and I just showed you this right here would be like a mesophyll cell, okay? So you can see all the little chloroplasts in here, underside here, you can see the stomata, okay? This would be the vein, just like you have like veins in your are all over your body, right? These veins are xylem and phloem, xylem, tran xylem transports water primarily, and phloem transports sugar. So these are the veins, like what you see in a leaf. And surrounding those veins are something called bundle sheath cells. Just take a look at the way they look, all right? So these plants could fall prey to photorespiration. Now let's look at an, a, an, an adaptation that some plants have, and these are called C4 plants. And this prevents photorespiration, but it's not super efficient because basically this is how they solve it. They lock RUBP away in these bundle sheath cells and they just do the Calvin cycle here and not in the rest of the leaf, okay? They do it well right there, but it's at a very limited area. And the way they do that is these bundle sheath cells, if you look to your left, these bundle sheath cells don't have any chloroplasts in them. They normally don't do photosynthesis. These bundle sheath cells are, and this insulating layer, a ring of cells like this, that's called Krantz anatomy. Krantz is German for wreath because it kind of looks like a wreath. And so they have um, a compound in here called PEP who will escort the CO2 into these bundle sheath cells. So that's the only gas it faces. So it never hooks up with any kind of oxygen. So where do you see C4 plants? Sugar cane, corn, areas where it's warm or in the tropics, where the stomata could close for a while and the O2 levels could build up. So if you compare that, those bundle sheath cells, right, that are around the vein are here. Here's the meso mesophyll cells, which would be like a circle around it. And there's a compound called PEP and it'll hook up with the CO2 and escort it in here to your Calvin cycle. So on your notes, you have 8.4 alternative pathways for photosynthesis. Photorespiration is not good for plants, so plants seek to avoid it. When it is hot, the stomata close to conserve water, CO2 levels decrease, and they get used up. Um, oxygen builds up in the interior of the leaf and competes and competes with CO2 for RUBP. This is um, the inefficient process called photorespiration. What I've just shown you, this adaptation, C4 plants, it is an adaptation to avoid photorespiration and it is a partition in space. A partition in space because they're just doing their Calvin cycles in these bundle sheath cells. The Calvin cycle reactions are isolated within the leaf and an alternative molecule called PEP, who is very faithful and only hooks up with CO2, no matter how much O2 is around, will escort it in, okay? Um, it does cost energy to do that, um, but it is advantageous in hot, dry climates. Let's look at another strategy. This is a partition in space. Let's look at one as a partition in time, and you can see this in pineapple plants. Basically, they use the same thing, PEP, 
But at night when it's cool, they will store all the CO2 they possibly can by hooking it up with PEP and store it so during the daytime when the stomata close, the PEP can release the CO2 to the plant as it needs it. So that's a partition in time, the CAM photosynthesis. You fix CO2 at night to PEP when stomata can afford to be open. You release the CO2 during the day once the light dependent reaction begins. Photosynthesis is minimal, but it allows the CAM plants to live with their stomata closed during the day. All right, just because this is a close of a unit for my students, um, I want to go over just a few little reviews comparing and contrasting. So chloroplast, only in a plant cell, mitochondria in both plant and animal cells if they're eukaryotic. Chloroplast makes sugar and stored energy, whereas mitochondria releases usable energy from that sugar. Remember, sugar is a potential energy. It's making it so it's there, and then you cash that sugar out when you need it in your mighty mitochondria. Chloroplast needs to absorb sunlight, so it has to have chlorophyll, whereas the mitochondria does not need sunlight, so it does not have to have chlorophyll. So photosynthesis is gonna happen in the daytime. Mitochondria happens all the time. Let's look at another chart of that, okay? So where does it occur? That part's pretty easy when in the presence of light or all the time the input is carbon dioxide for photosynthesis and the output output is glucose and oxygen um, here for respiration the input is glucose and oxygen and the output is carbon dioxide and water and also remember um your oh, i'll get to that in just a minute look at your energy sources or light right, to do photosynthesis, but your energy source for mitochondria is the energy of these, uh, of the glucose molecule, right, within each of those bonds. So what happens as a result? This is the energy stored, an endergonic reaction where this energy is released and then coupled, right, with the ATP synthesis, all right? So that's it. I hope you feel strong about that, and uh, I will see you in class.